What's up, everyone? Welcome to my corner of the internet. I'm your host, Ryan Kramer, and this is Crossover Commerce, presented by Ping Pong Payments, the leading global payments provider helping sellers keep more of their hard-earned money. Hey, what's up, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of Crossover Commerce. I'm your host, Ryan Kramer, and this is my corner of the internet where I bring the best and brightest in the Amazon and e-commerce space. Uh, what is this podcast all about? This is Well, this is episode uh, 245 of my corner of the internet. Like I said, bringing be- great uh, service providers, sellers, um, and companies together to give great content for you, the either beginner Amazon seller, um, e-commerce seller, trying to grow your business internationally, wherever you are in your journey, We want to make sure we bring applicable and relevant information to help you grow your business moving forward. So uh, with that being said, every podcast episode here at Crossover Commerce is presented by Ping Pong Payments. Who's Ping Pong Payments? Well, we are a cross-border payment solution helping more people keep their hard-earned money. When you have the fees and structures that are selling on Amazon, there seems to be nickel and diming everywhere. We're talking about referral fees. We're talking about all these storage fees. We're talking about increase in costs things like that where it's cost of doing business, but why don't you just keep more of that um, when it comes to payment remittance or paying out um, entities in different currencies? How do you do that? You just go to usa.pingpongx.com forward slash podcast for all of our past episodes, but also to sign up for free today. It's free. Like I said, free is you know free. You, you can sign up for free. Check it out. See if it's going to be a great fit for you and your growing business and save some money today. Who wants to? Who doesn't want to put more money to their bottom line? to help grow their business overall. So go ahead and check it out. Go ahead and let them know that Ping Pong Payments, at Ping Pong Payments, that crossover commerce sent to you. Um, If you're new to the show, thank you for uh, tuning in for the first time today. We're live on LinkedIn, on LinkedIn, Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. Or if you're listening to this later on, this is actually May 6th. Um, But if you're catching this podcast episode audio format, thank you for tuning in and downloading all of our episodes. we are uh, we're gonna we we come and bring guest or guests today. We have a couple guests that we're gonna be bringing on today. Like I said, with different topics uh, that are gonna be applicable to either their business or just what's relevant in the Amazon e-commerce space. So if you are listening live, you can ask questions or just say hello on the comment section below um, or to the side if you're watching on YouTube. Um, we see all those comments. Just let us know you're listening. Uh, give us a thumbs up or anything like that. Um, we'd love to interact with you. If you have a question about some topic that we have or are covering, you can also get that question answered live and be more than happy to get that taken care of for you. If you catch this on a, on a replay, no sweat, just tag our guests or myself in it and we'll make sure that we get you covered as well. So without further ado, I don't want to leave our guests waiting any longer. We have a great podcast lined up for you today. I actually have two that we're going to be doing, um, but two guests right now in this episode. 245. Um, a lot of people struggle, I, I think, with so many different barriers that have come up in the last couple of years with growing on Amazon. I think it's even more important to start with the basics and really hone in on your craft. That is in product selection, that's manufacturing, that's prep, label, and inventory. Um, you have to make sure that every part of the process is going to be unlocked. So I brought two experts, um, people, um, people that have been in the business for a very long time and that are helping other brands and businesses kind of hone in on each aspect of that business and helping you grow. What's better than that? So without further ado, I am excited to bring on two members of the Breitley team. That is Robert Pollock and Josh Maynard of Breitley. Gentlemen, let me go ahead and bring you on. Unmute you. Let's press the button. There we go. Perfect. I pressed it too many times too quickly. Josh, Robert, thank you so much for hopping on Crossover Commerce today. Hey, how are you? Thanks uh, for having being here. Josh, you weren't there. I'm living the dream, man. This is this is Friday in uh, May, so uh, it, clearly it's raining outside and it feels like 50 degrees here in Indiana. So it's lovely here. Um, you guys are what, in New York or where are you guys at? Yeah, we're in New York where it's also 50 <laughs> and dreary. I haven't seen. I feel like I haven't seen the sun in a couple of weeks, and that found, sounds very terrible. But hey, spring. It's supposed to rain, and uh, but I'll be in New York next week. I think uh, I'm not sure if you guys knew that or not. Uh, I'll be there. So uh, st- uh, for everyone who's listening to this, if you're in New York, hit me up. I'm gonna be there all week. Uh, it's GTG uh, Ecom Co-op event, but also just meeting uh, awesome people like hopefully you guys. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we will be there also, so we will probably see. You. 
we'll run around and uh, we'll say, hey, didn't we just see each other? So uh, <laughs> it'd be great. We'll reminisce about all the things that we talked about today. But hey, th gentlemen, thank you so much for hopping on. Um, since I have two of you, I want to make sure we, we divvy up kind of the the who you guys are and make sure how we got to today. It's always fascinating, I think, how people get in e-commerce, especially, um, you know, the different windy roads. Uh, maybe, Robert, start with you. Uh, how, how did we get to Breitly or were you in e-commerce before and this is just a, a stop along the way or what, what's that journey been like for you? So actually, yeah, I started in real estate. So yeah, no one really starts in e-commerce. <laughs> start, so started selling things, right? Uh, uh, properties or what, what kind of real estate are we talking about? Yeah, um, commercial office space, Midtown Manhattan, Florida, all across the U.S., uh, commercial office space, strip malls and stuff like that, managed uh, portfolios, had my real estate license. I was in construction. I was everything real estate I was in. Um, but then I started getting into, I got into e-commerce. I knew that was up and coming. Amazon was still, I won't call it in, in, in its infancy, but uh, it was still small. I was like, hey, you know what? There's a whole bunch of brands. I knew a whole bunch of people. Uh, started a company around six years ago, um, Markets Unite, went to brand owners, like manufacturers, say, hey, let us run your Amazon account before there are any uh, companies like that. Now there's uh, plenty. So um, basically that, that that's that's where it started. And um, Breedly was actually two separate companies, two management agencies that merged during COVID, March 2020. And um, we've worked with over between the two companies, 200 clients managed just over half a billion in sales on Amazon. And last year, probably around 10, 12 million in advertising spend we managed. So, um, yeah. So not yeah, too bad. Was, yeah. That's and, awesome. Uh, jo Josh, what about you? Uh, not, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to guess, I'm going to go on a limb, not construction or were you in construction? You guys met through no. construction and he brought, uh, Robert brought you over. No, no, no. Uh, uh, no, I started, so I, I started my career in e-commerce pretty much right out of college. I mean, I did a few odd and end jobs right out of college. But then uh, around 2005, 2006, I was already based in that. Um, so I've always been in e-commerce and I've always been specifically in third party e-commerce. So I've been working with Amazon since 2007, but I've done all the whole litany of e-commerce sites from eBay to StubHub to uh, Jet to Sears to whatever decided to make themselves a marketplace at the time. Um, and then at the early, early in my career, I bounced around from Amazon center companies to sports tickets, things like that, which is how I got to work with StubHub and SeatGeek and TickPick and Ace Tickets and all those you people. Like a, I was gonna say, you look like a huge Yankees fan. Oh. <laughs> um, I'm just kidding no, folks if you're listening to this uh Josh has a pretty bright I, I didn't wear my Cubs hat otherwise I would have brought it to the party um but he's wearing a Boston Red Sox hat so I, I am I'm actually right. okay I gotta I'm not wearing a Boston Red Sox hat this oh, wait that's is, a this that's is, a Brooklyn this hat. is a Brooklyn okay, sorry hat. looking looking close that is a Brooklyn hat so that is my fault do you, I am, do you think I could walk in midtown Manhattan with a with a Boston Red Sox hat, be, I would never would, make it to work. Very, uh, <laughs> very ballsy of you. If you <laughs> no, I, I was going to say, this is interesting. Like, tell me more. Yeah. <laughs> if, Gosh, I, if, I, if I wore this on the subway, I would call every morning. I got stabbed again. Uh, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, Josh, um, you were part of the, the, when they, when they first launched advertising on Amazon, right? Like, Amazon. yeah. So, so when they first were put, when they first launched their ad platform, I think this is 2011, somewhere around there. Sure. They, they, they. It sounds weird now, but they were begging companies to do advertising, like because no, because there was no real point. So they started this. They had this pilot program to train people on how their advertising platform worked, and they gave you know, um, and it was like a six, it was like a six week training program of their you know just run through whatever, it remained a pilot program. They did not do a second class, um, either mainly due to a number of different factors that I, they decided not to com, com, uh, continue with it. But yeah, when they first started uh, their advertising platform, uh, that I took, I was part of the original training class. Um, 
to get it started. That's um, awesome. So yeah, so I've been doing it. So from yeah, from the ad platform for Amazon, I've I've been doing it pretty much as long as Amazon's been doing it. That's all. So, so were you, so were you both different? And like you said, Robert, maybe is this clear? You guys said you had merged. Was this two separate companies? Or so, what was, yeah, what was this? So I did, I've, I've been with Greeley for a year. Actually, Tuesday will be a year. So uh, awesome. if you want to get like a case awesome. or bagels or something, <laughs> you made uh, it that a, would be year, cool. uh, a year. Josh is still employed. There you go. Uh, yeah. So I got, I, I was brought in about a year ago. Um, um, to to this company, so I, I was not with them with the merger or whatever. Uh, but yeah, gotcha. that's where we are now. That's awesome. So you've seen obviously the gauntlet. You've seen the the iterations that Amazon continuously comes out. But you've also touched many marketplaces, which is really cool. And uh, yeah, I mean, in two thousand eight, I would have told you that eBay is the future. So <laughs> <laughs> you know, it so still could be, but us. we don't it know what's going to happen. They could come uh, back. Yeah. We don't know. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I've definitely seen uh, not just Amazon, but all the various marketplaces on who's, you know, I, I think it was 2015. I met with Mark Laurie when he was launching Jet, telling me yeah. how that was going to take. <laughs> there, you know, so That's how done... you know if you've been in the business for a while. If you mentioned Jet.com, <laughs> you're like, oh, I remember Jet. I remember the hype around Jet for sure. Yeah. Um, the whole acquisition by Walmart. Yeah. I, I, wish can't, they... I, can't, I can't remember what conference it was, some conference in Vegas, but they gave out so much swag. I think I still have like five of their t-shirts. They just, they, they, they spend more on swag than everyone else at that conference combined. And they just gave it all away. That's where you go to eBay to start selling vintage t-shirts like that now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, so, so you guys, so you guys came together, you've been here a year. Uh, maybe if people haven't been in Britley, what, what's kind of like the, the company you guys, because we, we titled today's topic pretty broad um, for, for, for a good reason. Um, product selection manufacturing prep label and inventory planning there's a lot to cover there what so what does Breitly do does it do everything or what, what are we what are we talking about here so Breitly we are our core focus is full account management so we get licensed manufacturers brand owners onto Amazon they're used to selling to like the Costco's and the BJ's and the Walmart's of the world TJ Maxx and all of that we get them onto Amazon, we work with them, create a product selection, work with them in manufacturing goods specifically for Amazon, how to prep, how to label, how much to bring in, replenishments, things that end up selling out. We run the advertising. We do everything for our clients when it comes to Amazon. And then we take them off of Amazon, we get them onto Walmart and Target, but we sort of are an all-in-one uh, service. But we have broken up our services individually. So if anybody needs any individual help on any one subject or a handful we're able to uh, help them out as well and, and depending on some some of our clients are well established and they've been around 70 80 years and they don't need help with product selection they they have a core business and then other clients are like we do this but we know that's not really good for e-commerce please help us figure out what we could like we could we could make whatever you want we, we have a factory we have a warehouse how can we sell on it and then there we go much deeper into product selection and research like that so we do so depending on the client we you know we do every you know everything from helping out with logistics to picking uh to literally picking products or to guiding a client you know to what they what would be best for them in gotcha. terms of product Here, here's gonna maybe um hopefully it's not a negative question how do you guys stay on top of everything in that in that gauntlet because that's a lot to handle um a lot of people just either focus on ppc only or product selection um you know, uh, manufacturing only. How do you guys stay on top of all of that and and consider yourself, hey, you know, better than everyone else in that space? I mean, we have a decent sized staff, so we do have people who specialize in PPC and who. Uh, oh, Josh, uh, Josh I think we yeah we just garage. lost your audio. I think so. So people, who, you know, so we have. Am I back or? Yep, you're back. Okay, sorry. Um, so yes, we have so we have uh, we have people here who are better with wholesalers, and we have people you know. So that's kind of how we divvy it up. Um, not every person here is going to be the person you speak to about product selection, and the person you speak about you know inventory planning. Um, but overall, if you have if you have an account manager with us, that account manager has access to everyone who has all the experience and knowledge and whatever you know whatever it was brought up that you need. Yeah, so um, we have, 
10 people in-house. We have another 20 uh, overseas that uh, work with our in-house team. There are verticals so that each person has a specific direction that they go into. Um, there is the way that we like to break it up is each account manager doesn't have more than six to 10 accounts. I don't want to flood them and then lose capability of, of uh, being able to provide the best service for all the other clients. So we like to keep a, a small list, a small book per account manager. And then he uses the different people within each vertical to do each specific type of task. We have someone specific for customer service messages, someone specific for shipping, someone specific for IP and infringement issues and account health problems. Uh, so every single field is well covered. Um, and obviously Zendesk or some type of ticketing system, we happen to use Zendesk and, um, and a whole bunch of different services. I mean, just because we don't manufacture our own products doesn't mean we don't need to use different SaaS programs. Um, we need to use a lot of different softwares to help us get our job done. Gotcha. A lot of subscriptions, a lot of, yeah, d different yeah. products and insights for sure. Uh, so, so I guess, uh, so what in this capacity... Who, who are the people that are coming to you right now? Like who, um, in the stasis of Amazon and, in, in, you know, e-commerce in general, there, there was this really big wave of, Hey, everyone's jumping on in 2020, 2021, start to see this dip, uh, for you guys. I'm, I'm, I'm curious because we covered this gauntlet of all these different, you know, uh, entities and topics. Where's the most need of help right now? Where, where are people struggling? Where, where are Amazon sellers or e-commerce sellers coming to you guys and say, this sucks. I need help. I need you guys. So, probably, yeah, yeah, Robert, you go. Yeah, I mean, I would probably say uh, advertising would be a huge problem for people. Um, and in regards to like indexing, making sure products are found, because if you're not paying to play, you definitely need to uh, get your products indexed SEO wise. Um, so, in regards to redoing the content, a whole bunch of people are reaching out for that. And I mean, they don't, uh, specific companies, they don't have, they might not all have the budget to hire an in-house team to run their account. And they've tried a couple of people, they hired someone in-house, they tried some other agencies that might not have been around for so long and they've had bad experiences and they don't even know how much money they end up making, you know, with all the different fees and it's hidden, it's hidden on that uh, distribution every two weeks they don't know what they're paying so they definitely need help in regards to understanding their profitability uh josh go for it so after after advertising which is definitely something that like advertising is something that established sellers come to us and they're like we we losing money we're not sure why we're selling product we're not sure you know we don't we have no you know so that's for a lot of established products and the other i say the second issue that they've had specifically since last year is inventory um with Amazon putting as last year in April and they put that limit on the number of units you could send in um, that just like broke a lot of, a lot of uh, sellers. Um, and now even when we, when we when we have new people who were looking to sell on Amazon, they're like, Oh, I'll buy 5,000 units to start or whatever. It is. So I'll buy a thousand units and be like, well, Amazon's only going to let you send in a thousand units because you're a new seller. And then, you know, they're like, well, I, bought this from China. I don't have a place to send it, you know? So like, so in terms of inventory management of what Amazon wants from you and what, what affects your IPI score, um, how fast you need to turn around, how, what Amazon really wants you to have in their warehouse, which has changed over the years. Um, their philosophy used to be, you know, send us everything will be your warehouse. No problem to, don't you dare send us too much um, eight weeks. And that, you know, the max to we're going to start charging you if you if we have your stuff for too long. And now we're going to start charging you even, you know, starting in nine months, we're starting to charge. Mm -hmm. um, so certainly inventory management within Amazon's ecosystem is a huge issue for people, um, as well as their the workaround of doing something like FBM becomes a, a, a large logistical lift for a lot of people. We certainly help them navigate what goes on FBA, what goes on FBM, where, you know, if Amazon's saying you can't send in, you know, 
more than a certain number of units, where are you putting those units? You know, you can't just, you know, put them in your in your basement and hope your wife doesn't notice. Um, which is something that they're definitely sellers who order, they find some guy in Alibaba, he ships, you know, they think it's all gonna, you know, he they get labeled in China for Amazon and Amazon's like, we're not taking this many. Um, so now you're, now you're stuck trying to figure out what to do with your unit. So that I'd say after advertising, just figuring out Amazon's own inventory crunch and limit, and it's ever changing. I think just to keep you on your toes, I don't know if they have a real logic behind it. I think they just have fun with it. We're going to make it 1000 today, 2000 next week. Who knows why they do it? Um, but yeah, that would be, that would be, I think, I think a large issue for a lot of sellers. So with that being said, I, I hear a couple of different things there, Josh and Robert. I hear, People don't kind of look down the road. They look a little more short term. Is is that a fair assumption to say of maybe the problems at hand are maybe like immediacy instead of planning planning ahead a little bit more or a little bit further down the road than you know if this then this almost like the logical SOP you know route tree if you will of is, is that what people really are struggling with? Of I mean for sure. I SOP? think there I think there are a lot of people who see people who see other people make money on Amazon and go, I'll do that. And then they don't immediately turn a profit and they're not entirely sure why, mm. um, you know, they, they, the, the clients we have that are willing to invest ad money at, at break even, or even at a loss so they can get their rankings up knowing that may, they may not make profit for six months. Now, you know, now do better. Um, there is there yeah there definitely is a little bit of short sightedness in new Amazon sellers, and I think that also a a lot of the just Amazon rules and regulations and paperwork they want from you a lot of a lot of new sellers just are not prepared for a lot of the stuff Amazon asks for you know they're like oh I own I this is my product and Amazon's like cool do you have brand registry you know we want we want your trademark papers. And someone's like, well, I just own it. Did I, you know, did I actually go get a lawyer and trademark this? Or do I just, or do I just make up a logo and put, slap it on something? And, you know, so, you know, Amazon wants your insurance certificate. And a new, a new seller who's not selling a ton of stuff may not, now has to go Google what that is. So there's a lot of, so, it's, so I think for new sellers, it's, uh, yeah, the short term is very difficult for them because a lot of stuff gets thrown at them really quickly. Um, and that makes it difficult for them. Unfortunately, you know, for our clients, at least, we're here. We guide them through the process. We handle whatever we could handle for them on their behalf. Certain things we can't do. Obviously, we, we slow walk them through the process so that they get it. And then after their first season or two, that's when our clients start seeing the long term and they start understanding the whole ecosystem and how they need to start thinking. So with yeah, that, when we yeah, go ahead. when we pitch clients, we pitch them as like a like a two year investment. Like you're gonna, you know, from at the beginning, just getting your logistics in line, it could take months and getting your new products and what, you know. So we, we try to we try to at least set expectations for new clients of when you're really going to make money. Um, you know, you really in, in year two, not necessarily after two years, but in year two is really when we see most of our clients take off from doing a few thousand to a few million. So with that being said, is there, I, I guess a lot of the, the handholding that you have to do is the beginner sellers. What about if someone is a little bit more established? Is there, is there a difference in, in kind of expectations, but also struggles of you? Oh yeah. It used to be this way. And like, I've been selling for maybe three years now or some more of that SMB we size thing. Is that difference in you know, struggle or, you know, that it's just a whole different ballgame for that. I would say definitely some of the, some of our, some of our sellers who have been selling to big, to, you know, brick and mortar retail and they've had companies for 50 years have struggled to pivot. They know they have to, and they know like, you know, some of them like, Oh, my son-in-law keeps telling me I have to start selling online. You know, so they know they, they know they have to, and they're willing, but there's a lot of just, ingrained business thought that was correct or might still be correct for other things that they have difficulty 
um, either letting go of or just moving us, you know, moving a little bit on. So we do have that, especially on people, you know, real established companies that do, you know, millions and millions of dollars, just not on e-commerce. And things are always changing on Amazon. So no matter how long you've been selling, they throw throwing curveballs at you every uh, few weeks or every few months where major things change. So even even sellers who are established who came to us later on after they launched their accounts and say, hey, we pivoted away from previous people and we want to come to you guys. Um, most of the time, I mean, we're dealing with the business owners and they're not the ones who have ever managed their own Amazon account. Right. Um, so, so, you know, there is turnover on the lower ranks of the people who are managing the accounts, or we always make sure that we have a point person that we deal with. And that's the ones we hold the weekly meetings with and get all the information about the products and ask all the questions to, should we have issues and we can't solve them ourselves. So, um, we definitely, uh, yeah, I mean, no matter what, there's, a there's a lot that needs to get done. And, uh, having an in-house team that you employ, it gets very expensive. So, you know, definitely it, there's a lot of bang for your buck when you have an agency like us. Uh, we are very well priced. And um, yeah, anyone at home, Breitly.com, visit. Check I was going to say, already in the comments, that he's beating me to it for you guys. So if you're already, you're already listening to us or for more about Breitly, check out Breitly.com. In the comment section, everyone, make sure you check it out. If you're listening to this, it'll be in the show notes as well. Um, Josh, you have a, you brought up a good point. Forecasting and Robert, you mentioned on this too. You brought up forecasting, um, pricing changes. They're constantly changing. So if you're if you guys are effectively doing two two years out, how are you guys how are you guys effectively doing that and forecasting the changes that Amazon quote unquote throws the curveball at you with a whim or whatever? How how do you how do you forecast for that? So forecasting like new things like that come out of nowhere is a little difficult. Um, sure. You know, like when they decided, when they made the inventory crunch last year, that they didn't even tell we were, us about. It. They just they just <laughs> dropped it on people. There was no like news bulletin a week before. Yeah, I would say I would say us, along with most people, were relatively unprepared. Um, but we, you know, within a month or two, we had a you know plan. But in terms of forecasting, um, so we will start off like with a lower, you know, a lower line of products, you know, a few products. Hey, let's start here. Let's test the market. Let's, uh, in the beginning, we're doing a lot of, a lot of competition research. Um, you know, even for established brands, trying to find whatever white space there is, um, trying to find just, you know, right price point, right advertising, right. You know, at least for the first few products. That's why when year two, we tend to go bigger because we already, because now we're not looking at just competition data we're looking at our own data and seeing what worked and what real you know and that's how we that's how we can that's how we grow the second year is the first year you know or six months really we're basing a lot we're making a lot of assumptions based on competition and we're using you know the all the various softwares that are out there whatever from jungle scout to human 10 to whatever uh to scout the smart scout there's two dozen of them that i think we uh, sometimes forget we pay for every month. Um, and they and, thank you for your service. Yeah. <laughs> they're, they're deaf, yeah. Um, but, and so jump on that for the, for the short term. I mean, when you are choosing the new product, it does come back down to um, even, even setting up your case facts. And then when you have to now take into account these inventory restrictions, when we're launching a new account, how many styles do you have? Six. Are they color size variations? So how many SKUs do you have? Just in general, a lot of people don't even have UPCs for each size and color. They just have one UPC assigned to a specific style. So we work with them to make sure that, okay, because of these inventory restrictions, get your case packs as small as possible. I'd love to get a 12 or an 18 case pack of light color, like size in one box to make sure that Amazon doesn't split the shipment up to a hundred different places. Um, and so that you're able to test and I don't even like to, when it comes down to shipping to Amazon, I, you know, with that a thousand, I don't want to eat up that thousand unit space right away. And, you know, take up two thirds of the space because you're going to have to replenish once you have some hot sellers that you need to really move on quick. So, yeah. And in the beginning, we, there's a lot of handholding, at least on our end. Like we have had people send in stuff that comes back as oversized. They have no idea why. They're like, it's only like a five inch thing. How's it? And, you're, and you see their packaging and you're like, this is 
Now, you know, this is why it's happening. Your packaging is all over the place. Is it as simple as you guys throwing out on the side, air stuck in the poly bag, so it's really a lot bigger when it gets to Amazon than their warehouse measured it. Is it is it as simple as that? Like I say, simple it, for as experienced as you guys are, and, and I want to I want to kind of get, you know, this is a maybe pat on the back. Is it as simple as just getting your eyes on something? As simple as like looking at a product, and you can just instantly just assess, almost like a doctor, right? You're like a doctor of assessing business failures or what what's my symptoms and issues. You're like, well, this is it because it comes from you have a manufacturer who oversteps it or a packaging. Um, you need to re reconfigure the. The source of it instead of treating the symptoms does that make sense is I it mean, as simple as that for you guys that you can sometimes, sometimes yeah sometimes yeah sometimes i mean we through through our you know collective experience with the company like there every account manager can look at a listing and tell you what's wrong um like you know we don't need the like there are there are softwares that you know like chrome extensions that give you work for the most part everyone here can look at it and be like your pictures are bad your title is wrong your description needs work you know, you're clearly not indexing, you know, so, I, you know, for you, you're in the wrong category, you know, so from the, from a, from a glance, just from looking at uh, thousands and thousands and thousands of different listings, you do get an idea of, you know, in, a, a, pr a pretty instant look of what is wrong. And then when people come to you with specific issues, which we had, we actually had a call with a, a client today who was asked, who was saying, Oh, uh, he had this inventory issue, blah, blah, blah. And we're like, yeah, you have it. Six of our clients have it. This is what you need to do. You know, so it's not, it's just, you know, practice, practice basically. Uh, yes. You see it enough. Looking at the listing, you're not able to see what the problem is just by looking at a listing. A lot of the stuff, the high fees or what's affecting their account is all on the back end. So we are going to have to get in, you know, we have to get access, we'd have to diagnose the account, we'd have to look at it, see where all these different problems are, look at their distribution, well, how much are you getting charged? Well, wait a minute, this seems really high. What are you doing? How did your warehouse packing it? You know, things like that. I mean, earlier in the week, you know, there was like a ton, of, not a ton, but maybe like four different accounts that we managed who were saying that they were getting notifications from Amazon where we can't scan your barcode label. Turns out that the factory is putting uh, the labels there. They're printing out the barcodes on shiny, glossy labels. And that's not allowed. Yeah. Right. And then, you know, it's messing up their scanners. So as oh, I mean, and the, the factory never told them and never told the manufacturer, the, the license holder, you know, well, we're changing up the labels that we put on it. Normally they wouldn't. That's not even a thing. They, right. So, um, we got. We have to really keep a keen eye, and as soon as as soon as an issue pops up, well, why? How come? Let's go. You know, over you know standard size inventory shipped in a box that has a side longer than twenty five inches, and then they're getting these fees. How come they're not accepting my shipments? They might not realize. I mean, we told the client around in two thousand nineteen. Well, you're not allowed to ship to Amazon in a box over twenty five inches. And some people forget and you just have to remind and remind and send the documentation over again. Uh, communicate. We speak with the factories themselves. We deal with the distributors themselves that are that are sorry, the, the warehouses themselves, because we know the questions to ask. And there'll definitely be something lost in translation. If the if our client was to then go back to the factory and what are the right types of questions to ask? So we do take that next step and get involved in places that. They, our client might not be paying for, but it's what's best for our clients. So we make sure we take care of them 100%. That's awesome. Oh, uh, is there is there a source that you guys talk about like, hey, that, that I just didn't know about this or I thought it was this way, but it's not. Is there is there like a consistent source that's feeding people wrong information of like if it's from Amazon and they're just like, I'm reading Amazon's website and it's telling me this, but it's actually yeah. wrong. Like, is there... Is there consistent feedback that you guys are getting of, I thought it was right, and this is why, like, why I thought, now we're in this issue uh, because of it? I, th I think oftentimes, and this frustrates a lot of people, that because Amazon runs as, like, this disconnected company, there's often contradictory information coming from Amazon. Uh, we yeah. recently had this with our ad platform, specifically with sponsored brands. We'd go to, we'd, we would go to their website, and they would say this, and then we got on the phone with our ad manager, and he's like, no, it hasn't been like that for a year. Just no one updated it on the website. 
you know, so I think that's definitely a source of confusion and contention is that they're getting information, you know, they'll get an email from the ad platform and then they'll get an email from uh, regarding inventory and an email regarding I their you know, they go into the help section on Amazon. Right. In the question. Um, and, and then a lot of the, and then a lot of the automated stuff, like we've had products flagged for wildly incorrect things that we call, we'll call up seller support and be like, yeah, okay, it's fixed. And you're like, well, why did you, why did you do it in the first place? Like, oh, that's not us. That's someone else who's randomly shutting down. Product. You know, so uh, I think that's, that's always a source of confusion for a lot of our clients is that a lot of information comes from different places despite it all being under the Amazon umbrella. Interesting. So, so does that, does that provoke people enough to move away from Amazon in your guys' opinion of, I would like to have more control over my ecosystem, whether it be FBM or a different marketplace. Is there that, I, is there that I, enough contention yet? I think there are people who would, who would, if not for the money, you know, like they, <laughs> everything. Like, goes yeah, back to money. yeah it's just, like they will play they're they would not put up with the amount of stress and other things for different for different uh marketplaces but they know like okay so you know this went wrong this went wrong this cost me that but then i moved you know but we did we made a profit and you know so we do see we do see clients like trying to you know at least um diversify and go on places like walmart go on target um, to, you know, to try to get, you know, to try to not be beholden to Amazon completely. Um, you know, because the last thing someone wants is to build a $20 million business and then have Amazon just shut you down for six weeks over some, you know, over a violation. Um, and by, you know, by time you get it fixed, it's, you know, it's, you know, you've, you're done, you've lost quite a bit of money. Yeah. No matter what Amazon throws at them, they're, they're still, 50% of all sales that happen in e-commerce is still happening on Amazon. So they're not getting turned away. Well, you know, we're not dealing with a Nike direct or a Ikea direct who doesn't want to sell on Amazon. Um, but what I do see is people are not ready to go over to a Walmart or a Target yet because they're not as sophisticated or built out as a mar of a marketplace as Amazon. So they see it as it's going to be too much of an investment without possibly getting enough sales out in the short term. And that's, again, going back to your question, is their short term stopping them from growing? Sometimes, 100%. So, Robert, I'm, I'm going to dive into this. I think it's fascinating. You, do you think it's more platform issue than it is for sellers who are ready to diversify and ready to build upon a business that, you know, I have to learn a little bit more? Obviously, international is a whole different ballgame. Um, we're talking about different platforms are, you know, clearly different. You need to have... Like you guys at Breedly have your own team dedicated to Walmart or to Alibaba or to, you know, Mercado Libre, Rakuten, you name it. There's hundreds of, yeah, Target, yeah. Uh, even Target, like um, the number two and three. And now Shopify is now building out even more of a, uh, you know, they bought delivery yesterday, uh, breaking news of they're acquiring a now 3PL uh, and delivery system. So there's more marketplaces emerging that are trying to take it on. Is it more of the marketplace that's not ready or is it more of the seller who's like hasn't had their own business kind of tighten it and ready to grow for that next level? Um, I would say it would probably be on the seller. I mean, tons of sales happen on Walmart and Target. It's not like they're not a developed enough platform. But our clients, I mean, in order, talking about deliver, in order to deliver, yeah, you know, for a lot of these marketplaces, not, w, you know, not Walmart, they got WFS, but for, the, the targets of the world, they, most of our guys, they're not set up to fulfill one by one unit themselves. And that's why you use deliver. So we have clients who do use deliver and that's when we're start, you know, that's when that conversation uh, does take place. Okay. I'm down. Let's go. Let's spread. And that's where we're able to then start with all the integrations, work their copy over, get them onto target or Walmart or even build a Shopify store for them. Uh, but I would say yeah. it's definitely more on the client side. Go ahead, Josh. Uh, yeah, I think that over the last few years, a lot of sellers have just relied on FBA so heavily that they haven't really invested in their own infrastructure. They'll use a 3PL, even if it's expensive, you know, they'll use, they'll, they just send, they'll send stuff in directly from, 
they'll you know have make an order in, in China send it directly to Amazon. So they so because they've had that for so many years and it's become right. kind of a crutch to them investing in their own infrastructure. Now when they're being told like these platforms or these other marketplaces don't necessarily provide you with all the things that FBA does, there is this hesitancy. I know also the other hesitancy is they 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 still they they want to stay with Amazon as long as they're making money on it. It's not like they no one wants to leave, um, be, you know, because they're just it's too profitable for them at the moment. Um, if that you know if that were to change in a few years, which it might, as like every time we speak with Walmart or Target, it's clear that they're just pouring money into their marketplaces. Um, they're hiring. They're getting you know developers, whatever they're doing, I don't think they're there yet, but they're trying to be, you know, and it's not for lack of effort and money. Well, here, here's maybe a philosophical question of entrepreneurship is its own ball game, as you guys probably know this. If you're running your own business, you want to be more than likely first to market. You're trying to outbeat competition. If every person who has a podcast or a microphone in front of them or someone who's recording something is saying, you want to go where competition doesn't exist or you want to go where people are shopping, people are shopping on walmart.com. They're going to those other marketplaces. If I know that there's not competition, unlike Amazon, I'll be printing money. Wouldn't I want to be first to market in my category and, and reap those rewards as, as the marketplace grows and takes over? Or so, do I have to wait? And why would I wait around if that's a true entrepreneur? You, so you are correct that there's certainly less competition but also the marketplace is smaller, you know? So that's, that's, you know, you could be, you could be first on target, but you're, you're just, it's unlikely you're going to just reach the same, just number of customers. Right. Um, and but that's, isn't 5% that's, more incremental better than zero. Like that, that's what I'm saying. It's like, if, if you're doing the math, I mean, I guess what, what, what is, what does it take for people to outweigh? What, what's that? Okay. Now I'm re like, Walmart's ready for me to, you know, jump on it. Like I needed to make 10% of my overall revenue. Like, is there a threshold and monetary wise, if money's the end all be all, what does it have to take for an entrepreneur nowadays that you guys are working with to even make that I mean, jump? I think if you're just getting started now and you want, I think it would be advisable to at least start with Walmart and like do Amazon, but then start your Walmart business now so that you know, take, uh, you know, a certain percent and set, you know, and, and try to at least build the infrastructure for, so, for, so that when they eventually get to the level where they're competitive or near competitive, you've already, you know, you're already established there. Um, there, is a little, there is a little bit I of mean, an issue. Sorry, Josh. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Go ahead, Robert. There is a little bit of an issue because, I mean, the majority of our clients, they are bigger companies so they they're when, when they first launch it's not the income stream doesn't happen yet so fast immediately so they want to see a proof of concept that we could sell that we'll be able to handle it so before they proceed to that next step of you know let me let me get a warehouse let me increase my expenses let me pour out some funds here to get to the next step like you're saying it's a smaller marketplace josh the sales won't be there as Amazon is. So they, they're still relying on that, on that clutch, but a hundred thousand percent. I mean, these up and coming marketplaces before, I mean, target, I have clients on target. They don't even have to advertise because they're getting the sales. Their products are on page one based off the search terms. There's hardly anyone, comp any competition there. So I tell them to go on to target. The other impediment to the other marketplaces is just their, software is just not that. like you want to sell on these other marketplaces and now you have to go to a deliver and you have to get some you know an api connector at every point of your now logistics pipeline there's potential for something to go wrong um and it happens all the time we constantly have listings that just aren't showing up somewhere or the pricing is wrong or the imaging is wrong because it's all pulling from, it's all pulling from their three different places and they all have to connect so Right now, it's 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 a lot. It's, there's a lot more like project management of just selling on these other marketplaces because you need other softwares and other companies, and you're paying other companies, and you're paying fees to you know you may not be paying FBA fees, but you're paying deliver fees, and you may not be paying you know 
um, you know, now you're paying for an API fee or whatever it is. So that, that connection in, that's an extra charge. Right. So, <clears throat> so those, those act as impediments. Um, not that they're impossible. We do it. So it's obviously, uh, you know, um, but it does add a wrinkle to the, the ease that up until recently Amazon has made. There's like, just send us your stuff and we'll sell it for you. So uh, maybe, maybe, again, going off of this, if I were to expand, again, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about international. If you, in your guys' opinion, is it easier or more likely that a customer would look more international through Amazon's own marketplace ecosystem or to jump to a, um, a marketplace like a Walmart or a, you know, somewhere else like a Wayfair or something here in the United States? Yeah. And obviously, if you're in different worldwide marketplaces, that's a completely Great different question. topic. Great question. Um, We're all about the great questions here on Crossover. Yeah, I mean, it comes down to VAT. Now you get into tax issues where um, so many, so many sellers, Amazon sellers. But you guys like, cover a lot, so I'm, I'm assuming these conversations come up quite a bit. Of yeah, same same thing with ping pong. People go, would I rather, you know, do I want to grow as a marketplace, you know, brand, or do I want to grow as an Amazon brand? And again, that's that's the next step, and let people think, oh yeah, just like plug it into Amazon or th go to Canada. Like you said, Robert, uh, there's VAT, GST, there's uh, localization, there's uh, different shipments and logistics issues of compliance, different Lord. categories can get in and out of tariffs and blah, 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 blah. I'm not here to dismantle, you know, any sort of notion of, oh, yeah, international growth on Amazon. But which one's uh, the lower barrier, if you will, if you guys had to pick? I mean, I think, inter I mean, international is... It's easier to get on because you can just do it through Amazon, but it comes with like I find a lot of people get scared off when they're when you're like you need to file taxes in England now or whatever it is you know you need to you you need a, a European three PL that you know so I find not that like people are like they understand the U.S. marketplace and now you know like we had a client like his socks just didn't sell in Europe whatever. Like maybe they don't wear those. Like who knows? They don't but like socks in Europe. Let's just right. Like it made no sense. But they did what you know. So he was like, "Oh, I would you know." So like Got you're looking local. at right. It's it's they don't send to, uh, the local address, and then what are you going to do with it? Destroy the inventory? I'm not going to pay to ship it back to the U.S. What do I do with it? There's yeah. that. There's the there's the converting the language. In regards I mean, to it's also if it was me and it was my brand, I would want my brand to be its own entity like i it's nice to be an amazon brand it's nicer to be a company that is diversified and can and where you're in a position where if some new third party website comes up you're in a position to be like okay we're already selling on four or five of them i just add this one and i and i think that a lot of our more successful established clients don't see see amazon as a channel not necessarily as the end goal. Okay, I, I like that. I like that answer. It's a channel, not an end goal. So in that in that conversation, when do when do you guys see or when do people feel like that next step is is warranted? Like, is there is there a monetary threshold? I, I go back to the monetary threshold. Is there a sales threshold? How do you guys naturally bring up like, hey, is this the time where we explore those options of whatever growth is? I can't imagine. Being an entrepreneur and just being happy in one market plus like you said it's a channel not it's an end goal so what's the end goal for most of your clients there so, you can go so so i I'll, I'll come back to that question but i just wanted to tag on to the previous one yeah, a lot of do. our clients have the licenses like for the disney and all these other big brands yeah, and awesome. licenses by territory so they don't mm. necessarily have the ability to sell in europe so that is also hamper, hamper by product. Okay, I get it. Thanks, Disney. We get it. Like, we, <laughs> we control everything. We know. No, that that makes sense. I and I know that's a one off. And again, it's same thing with food. Same thing with like consumables. Uh, something topical. Anything like that. It. I understand it's category dependent. I. I guess for you guys, what what's the angle from a, the clients that you are seeing in your portfolio? And clearly, we want you know more people who are listening to this to to explore that with you majority of your people what what's their ultimate goal because you guys have to help them get to that what is that goal so yeah so once they once we start seeing success on amazon we start 
start seeing sales and we replenish and then you know again to season one season two obviously this conversation of of moving beyond amazon doesn't mm -hmm. happen um during that first line that they run um in that in their first season of, of goods um but once they start seeing, like I have clients saying, I want to expand as much as possible, connect us into not only just e-commerce, any retail stores also. You know, okay. one of the owners of the company, um, he sells in retail. He has a separate company that he owns and he's got connections to different stores and other marketplaces that, um, and like, um, what are those, uh, like the deal sites? The uh... Yeah, like uh, coupon sites or, um, yeah, um, like a, a Brad Steals or a, an eBay. No, like, a, like a Zulily. Oh, uh, um, the flash yeah. sale sites and stuff yeah, yeah, flash like that. sales sites. Okay. So yeah, they, they, they're coming to us. They want to expand as much as possible. And once they start getting that juice and that pump up, well, I want to, I want to push, I want to push because now they're seeing things starting to move. That's where it's, it's, it's the easier way to get them into the Walmart or the target, then taking them internationally. That might be the next step after we take them to the other marketplaces, you know, let's, you know, the whole thing is get your toe in the water, be comfortable with it. So rule your own backyard, rule the U.S., get your products out there as, as far as possible. And if they have the ability to bring their brands internationally, that would be that third leg with taking them to, to outside the country. Gotcha. Josh, any, uh, any counter arguments or anything to add on to that? No, I mean, uh, very few... Our, most of our clients, the end, the thing they want at the end of the day is, I mean, profit. Not to, you know, not to too fine a point. They want to be profitable. They want to sell their goods. They, we, 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 we have a number of international clients who have a de very different business mindset than uh, a U.S. And they're very straightforward. Like I don't like. We're like, well, Amazon does this. Like, okay, cool. Like. How much money do I make, and if I oh, and can I make more elsewhere? You know, it's very straightforward, and that's I think the end goal of a lot of these companies is just like, can I make money? Yes. Okay. Cool. So then, then, then let's, let's move to Walmart too. Let's do whatever, whatever you want. You want to sell on Wayfair? We'll sell on Wayfair. We, you do it. You know, we'll whatever you think is a way to make some money, we'll do it. We're not, we're not evangelical. You know, we're not evangelicals for Amazon. Uh, we, you know. If, we can make money we'll make money if not we'll move somewhere else and i think that's a lot you know that's the prevailing attitude of most of our clients bottom uh, line rules everything yep yeah uh, absolutely and you can save. You know, yeah you might as well yeah. save that money and you can pay all of your vendors via ping pong there you that's go right. i was gonna yeah. say you, you you took my little uh and you could do that a little bit easier with ping pong um no with that if you guys had are you, are you both are you guys selling right now i know we've already hit the top of the hour and i want to uh thank you guys for hopping on today my last question is you guys have been in the business a lot would you guys ever start your own brand here shortly or in 2022 and if so is there a category or something that you look at as a you know kind of a more of a hey there's opportunity here and in, in this regards have you have you guys ever said that or thought it or would you do it yourself if you weren't running other people's um, I mean, we got NDAs. I wouldn't take other people's ideas. I wouldn't, you know, tell, you know, do one thing ourselves and then tell somebody else, you know, don't do it. No. Um, I we, we threw the idea around with finding different niches, maybe finding certain products. We had an idea in the office that everybody here will be part owner. Just jump on it. I was going to say, yeah. So let, I'll put it in more context. Is there opportunity still on Amazon to sell? Oh, plenty. There's plenty of opportunity to sell. You just have to know how to find it. Um, and that's where a lot of the people get lost. They don't know how to find and navigate and, and, and um, identify those areas, those white spaces. Um, and that's, that's one of the things that we do. But I wouldn't see ourselves coming up with our own products. That'll put us in competition with our clients. That's a of course. Complete, yeah. Josh, anything so, for you? Uh, sure. I was so say, I yeah. I would say a couple of things in terms of their Amazon feel saturated at times. Um, and then when you do a search for a specific product after page two, you're like, well, there actually only is like 20 things here. Like you can go into a store and find more, you know, so there are definitely, there are definitely categories that are not, you know, saturated that are certainly places to be. Um, 
and competition shouldn't throw you off too much. There are places where we have clients in just cutthroat categories and they make money because they're, because even though there's a ton of competition, there's a ton of, you know, your potential, their potential client base is humongous. Um, on the, on the, on the, on the other hand, there um, a, a way that I see a lot of people going and having success is looking for categories where brand doesn't matter. Um, you know, whether it's making some low-end kitchen item like a corkscrew, where I don't know where I got mine, but I have one. You know, things that, that you know, looking for everyday products that everyone has and that they buy on a regular basis. Like I, it's. Like I, I would say sh- try to shy away from, you know, one-time purchase or things that people buy every five years, you know, is it difficult to launch a brand, but things that are relatively, maybe you replace your, you know, you replace something every year, every two years, and people don't really know where their knives and forks came from, you know, not, you know, or not that, but they have them and they have ice cube trays and they have, you know, phone chargers or, you know, so just things that people aren't brand beholden, obviously, Clothing is very difficult since people are super brand, you know, super brand, you know, centric on things like that. Um, so that would be like my advice to people looking like there is definitely space. Um, and the best space is where think uh, everyday items that people buy that they just need and are, and you know, and don't around, necess- not right. season. Well, um, sure. Yes. Um, you know, there are. I mean, there also are like one-time opportunities. Like uh, I think it was five years ago, I made these sunglasses that were for the solar eclipse. There and yep. yeah, so we sold millions of them, uh, but not anymore, you know? So <laughs> it was really, a, you know, that was, uh, it was, I think the person who did it still has them in a the warehouse for the next solar eclipse. But it's coming up, um, yeah, in a few years, yep. Those are long FBA fees. Those are expensive. <laughs> it's <laughs> worth it for millions of units. Yeah, exactly. No, that those are all good points, and I appreciate that. Uh, for more information, so for you guys, um, again, I appreciate you spending an hour here in my corner of the internet, um, and I know we're going to probably see each other next week. For people who are interested, they're listening to this, uh, they just didn't get their questions answered, or, or they, they have them later on. How do they reach out to you guys and connect? Well, by all means, you can uh, email us, hello at Britley.com. That's our, uh, I get those emails. You can email me direct, Robert at Breitley.com. You can do that. You can go onto our website, Breitley.com, and click the contact us button from there. Uh, we are on LinkedIn. We have uh, our own podcast on uh, YouTube as well. I was going to say, tell me about that. What, what's the podcast cover? Um, well, it's called the Amazon Gold Standard. Okay. And we just started it. It's not only limited to Amazon, though. Uh, we only have two episodes on there. Okay. So we'll be bringing more, but it's basically any, any, anything that's retail, um, anything that's focused around retail, e-commerce, brick and mortar, doesn't matter. Even service providers, anyone who provides a service, I'll bring them, I'll bring them on. I want to talk about what they offer, what it can be used for, how it can better their business and try to bring traffic to them. So, uh, um, awesome. yeah. Love to hear that. Well, thank you guys so much for hopping on crossover commerce today um now i call you guys friends of the show so you're more than welcome to hop on anytime and share awesome information like we did today a lot of packed and jam-packed information we got to build into an hour so i appreciate that from both of you uh we'll catch you guys next week for sure so uh we'll see you uh here shortly and uh uh, sorry about the mix up with brooklyn versus uh boston (laughs) sorry about that josh Uh, yeah we we don't want you to be stabbed in the subway that's for sure So, hey, thanks, guys. Right. We'll, uh, we'll catch All you guys right. next week. All right. Bye. Bye. No problem. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. And thank you, everyone who hopped on Crossover Commerce today. This is episode 245 of My Corner of the Internet. I call it Crossover Commerce. Make sure you check out Britley at Britley.com. Again, the About Us or Contact Us page. That is the best way to contact um, Josh or Robert. Um, let them know uh, you, you heard us on Crossover Commerce. We have a lot of great companies who come on here, service providers. They, they hear the podcast and they say, hey, I need to know more about that person that's why we obviously give you the information to contact them it, um to help businesses grow that's what we're all about here on the crossover commerce so that being said thank you guys for coming on um a couple quick notes that you might have seen at the bottom of the tickers uh just a little we have a second episode today we're going to be mentioning a little bit about 
um, the Mexico trip. We are a media sponsor of the Mexico trip. Go to the Mexico trip.com. We talked about sourcing logistics a couple episodes ago from Mexico. Why to look at maybe Latin America for your options. And, uh, maybe if you're having trouble shipping, um, with your shipping and logistics from China or India or anything like that, you can definitely check them out um, and, and see the mastermind or just the webinar. There's a replay there. Just go to the Mexico trip.com forward slash webinar to get that replay. And just uh, if you're interested in going down there, make sure you sign up for that today. And also we'll be at the Ecom co-op event next week as well on Thursday. So a week from yesterday, six days ago until that event uh if you're interested in attending as a seller or as a service provider let me know and we'll be able to go to that it's in new jersey just outside of manhattan um at uh, tactical solutions warehouse where there's gonna be a lot of networking lots of events and a lot of uh, mind trust that people are meeting with each other so definitely check that out as well um go ahead and follow us on social media for more information on that that being said i'm ryan kramer this is crossover commerce we'll catch you guys next time later today on another episode of Crossover Commerce. Take care.